You're listening to Missing Panther. It was just the size of it. I mean, it it was massive. We don't want to reignite the story because we don't want all those people with guns coming back. There's two very, very definite schools of thought. There's those people that have seen something and there are those people who might even entertain the idea. What I did see was outside the realms of what I've seen. You know, I've seen a lot of things get killed in my lifetime, I said, but I've never seen anything that kills like this thing does. Oh my God, I'm sitting here looking at a panther. I am looking at the black panther. If somebody could sound a feral cat that size, I'd say, bring me the body. Simple as that. But I'll eat my own hat if somebody can do that. It was that dark, I couldn't see the crosshair through the telescope. Sided it up as best I could and pulled the trigger. Well, it's the stuff of legends. For years, there have been reports of giant cats roaming the bush right across Victoria. However, the department says there's no real proof that big cats exist here. Some American wildlife authorities believe this is the work of a mountain lion, known to be silent, solitary, cunning and extremely elusive animals. They're trying to deny their existence. It's time to get over that and admit there is something out there. They're definitely dangerous, yes. If they can pull down a 400 kilogram cow and kill it, they're perfectly capable of killing a human being. There's no doubt about that. Throughout this search for panther stories across the country, I've heard some amazing accounts from quite sensible people, ranging from doctors, zoologists, environmental scientists, academics, researchers, farmers, journalists, and many others who claim to have seen something resembling a panther or a big cat. There's no doubt there'd be an abundance of food for a large cat to thrive in the Australian bush, from kangaroos to possums, wallabies or emus, just to name a few. But one of the things that has been lingering in the back of my mind is the loss of livestock. With millions of sheep and cattle just wandering around paddocks like sitting ducks, surely there must be some story somewhere. After a little research on this, I found an interesting story dating back to the late 90s. A farmer by the name of Ron was screaming out on national news for government intervention to help solve a problem he was having with a mysterious animal killing his livestock on a weekly basis. I've had cattle taken within 100 yards of the house. In the past two years, more than 100 head of his cattle have either vanished or been found dead in adjoining bushland. He's convinced puma-like animals are to blame. So I tracked down Ron from South Gippsland, Victoria to see if he was keen to share a little more detail of what he went through. We'd had a lot killed over the years and we'd always blamed dogs. The very first animal we had that really woke us up that was cats. Mum was going around the cows one day and she found this heifer with all the bottom jaw chewed off, just teeth showing and no skin whatsoever on her bottom jaw. Her tongue was gone and um, all the bottom teeth were all showing, all, all the bottom jaw bone was showing. She came down to me and said, you know, can you come up and put this cow out of its misery? So anyway, went up, couldn't find it. Went up the next day, couldn't find it. The third day, the son found it and never had the rifle with him on the third day. And all he had, he had an axe in the cabin of the tractor. So the animal was down by then, couldn't walk. And he just went down and he split the head of the animal open with the axe, put it out of its misery. I would pick him up with my front end loader, you know, put a chain on each back leg and pick him up with the front end loader, split the hide down the middle of the backbone and then peel the hide back each side. Now, I don't know whether you've ever skunned an animal or not. Normally when you skin an animal, 
The fat under the skin is white. Imagine a tub of butter or a tub of margarine. That is the colour of the fat under the skin. Now, when you peel the skin back and the cats have been at them, from the tailbone right up to the back of their neck, where the cats have been hanging on to them, is just completely congealed blood. All the fats change colour. The back of their necks is all perforated where the cats have been biting them on the back of their necks. They will get round and get hold of them by the bottom jaw and um, small calves, they will grab them and they'll have get the whole muzzle of the calf in their mouth and suffocate them. But the large animals, they go to, they sort of bite through the spinal cord. You know, the teeth just go through between the joints. A dog can't get up and bite the back of a cow's neck. You know, if a dog, if a dog is attacking a cow, they attack them on the back legs. See? They don't get up on their backs. I had photos of stock that were being killed and mauled, you know, bloody near on a weekly basis. But what, what had happened, the cow would have a calf running on it. To get to the calf, they'd kill the cow. They'd eat the calf, and then they'd, the, the cow would just lay there and rot. Or if there was no calf, they'd kill the cow and eat the cow. Over a 10 year period, my mother and I, we lost over a thousand head of cattle. Mum was running Hereford at the time, and you'd go down to try and round them up if you wanted to sell some animals, and you could not round them up. You couldn't drive them, they'd just run for the bush. They were absolutely terrified. To round them up, we'd go down the three motorbikes and you'd drive them, just let them run until they were knocked up. And then once they were knocked up, you could get behind them and head them for the direction you wanted them to go. But until they were knocked up, you couldn't do a thing with them. There was one old cow, she always led the way. You couldn't do a thing with her. She, she was the ringleader and you could never get her in the yard. She always broke away. Anyway, we found her dead one day and she'd been trapped in between two logs. They were sort of at a right angle. When we found her, she had scars all over her back that were old and healed up. They'd obviously had many goes at her over the years and that was why she was so hard to do anything with. I've seen sheep that have been killed and they just peel the skin off around the face and down under the neck, but there is not a drop of blood on the ground anywhere. They just bleed them out and clean up all the blood. When a dog kills a sheep, there is wool everywhere. You know, if down in this area here, if you have problems with dogs, it is usually one of the local farmers. Their dogs will go rogue. It does happen. You know, a dog will take a liking to killing sheep, but they get caught out very quick. Out at Woodside, they had sheep out there they were still walking around and they had all their intestines hanging out their back end where their back ends had been eaten out and their intestines were just dragging on the ground behind them. They had sheep with their bottom jaws bitten off and they were still walking around with no bottom jaw. Yeah, alive and they put it down to young cubs learning how to kill. Ron's story was quite a bit to take in. I thought this would have been fairly big news at the time considering the amount of stock loss involved and being a rural area. So I went looking for a journalist who might have reported on this, hoping that someone might still be around. I was eventually led to a journalist by the name of Matt Dunn, who wrote a few articles about Ron's ordeal in South Gippsland. This is what Matt had to say. I was working at the Yarram Standard newspaper 
and it's one of those stories that comes along, you know, periodically someone will claim to have, to have sighted one or lost cattle to, you know, a, suspe a suspected attack. I was researching something for the newspaper when someone mentioned Ron and, you know, I got in contact. Went out to his place, saw his photos of kills that he suspected were from big cats. And yeah, look, he had he had a ton of um, correspondences with politicians and uh, you know the Department of Primary Industries, Industries as it was then. The most sort of compelling part of, of Ron's story was the the fact that he he had the backing of a, a DPI um, official. Um, who had a diary uh, with quite detailed um, anecdotes and descriptions of, of big cats that he'd seen. But he was gagged by the hierarchy of the organisation because you know he, his his testimony contradicted the official line. He had claimed to have seen uh, six big cats in an eight, eight year period, uh, and four, four were black and two were fawn. Well, this, is, this was the longest serving member of the team. Um, you know, this is a guy who, from all accounts, um, was highly respected, highly skilled, and knew the difference between a dog attack and what was occurring at Ron's place, which um, which he thought were were the work of, of big cats. The difficulty he, he had was that he was still in the profession. You know, he, if he said that he was a believer and he had had that um, that evidence, um, he was you know running a line that was contrary to, to the official line and, and basically it was a situation of you know if he spoke out he was going to be sacked so yes he did confirm you know what was in the diary but he just said I can't speak about it because I'll lose my job you know I'm, I'm a skeptical person by nature and it kind of comes with the territory when you're a journalist you cannot just you can't you can't just believe people but I certainly believe that those guys believe with the photos that Ron showed me and look I'm no expert on the way dogs kill or the way cats kill but whatever was killing Ron's um, stock was a was a massive creature or were massive creatures they were getting dragged you know dragged across across his property um these things were tearing off faces you know they they were big wild beasts and i i find it difficult to believe it was the work of, of dogs the way the stock was being killed was quite different to the way a wild dog would do it up and down the highway up and down the south Queen highway between yarram and, and you know, Lee and Gather and, and beyond towards Inverloch, there's um, there's been a lot of sightings around Foster and Fish Creek. I've heard a lot of stories, and you know, from people I know and and people who I think are quite credible. Yeah, it was certainly confirmation that something was going on, and I, I get I guess you would have to assume that it was an introduced species because I don't think there's a native animal that could do uh, what was being done. I think the, the thing that stuck in my mind about Ron was the fact that he almost became like a social pariah because he was out there, you know, telling these stories. And, you know, pe people would sort of take fun, but at the same time, I don't think people totally disbelieved him either. It was kind of like, yeah, it's okay to believe it, but just don't say it too loudly. Ron spent a lot of time shouting from the rooftops trying to get the government's attention and even spent countless hours trying to get his definitive proof by presenting a body on the table. 
there was a wombat dead on the side of the road and it had had a feed off it. So I went up the following night and I had one of the old um, international fire trucks and I parked that on the side of the road about 75, 80 yards away. And at the time I had a, um, a 22 Magnum rifle. That was the biggest I had at that stage. Anyway, I just sat there and it, was, it got to the stage, it was that dark um, I couldn't see the crosshairs through the telescope and I was just going to start the truck up and drive off and I saw this thing come up from the bottom side of the road, walk out onto the road on an angle across the road. So I got it in the middle of the telescope, sighted it up as best I could and pulled the trigger. And it just jumped straight up in the air about four feet and while it was in the air, it turned around and when it hit the ground, it was facing the right way to run back on off the road. And um, whether I hit it or whether I didn't, I don't know, but I tried. I was writing letters to the Minister for Agriculture virtually on a weekly basis, making a bloody nuisance of myself. The government would not admit that they were there, even though I'd seen them on quite a number of occasions. The head of the DPI, based in Ballarat, he came down and paid me a visit one day, and he said to me, he said, this is what it comes down to. He said, to prove their existence, you are going to have to produce the live animal or the dead animal, and then you are going to have the federal police and the federal customs wanting to know where you got the animal from and how you got it into the country because they will not believe that it's in the country or they, they will not admit that it's in the country he said and you will be looking at a prison term that's how it was explained to me by the head of the victorian dpi that was telling me to shut up after that i stopped trying to shoot it if, if I shot it, it wasn't worth going to jail for. It's the Department of Many Names. that They change their names as often as they change their trousers. I thought now I'd check on some stories about some sheep Ron had mentioned were slaughtered around the time he was having some trouble. The search led me to a small rural community by the name of Woodside, less than 50 kilometres away from Ron's property as the crow flies. Something happened here that was so strange, it was enough to trigger authorities in charge of stock loss investigation to jump into action for what can only be described as an unofficial hunt for panthers in a little place called Jack Smith Lake. One sheep farmer in this district lost close to 500 sheep in the past two years. The department declined to speak about the issue on camera. One property on the edge of Jack Smith Lake lost over 500 sheep in just over two years by something not even our best could put a name on, or just didn't want to. Helicopters kitted with thermal imaging equipment buzzed overhead for countless hours scanning this particular property for the culprits responsible for the massive stock loss, but had no luck and only ever found rabbits, foxes and apparently a snake. It wasn't just the amount of kills which sparked the authorities' interest, but the style of kill. The remains of these sheep kills could only be described as clean and done with the efficiency of a surgeon and only ever happening in the dead of night. I spoke briefly with the owners of the property at the centre of all this drama, but unfortunately they declined to speak with me at this time. Most people who were directly involved with the various investigations surrounding this property were honestly a little cagey about it and didn't really wish to speak on the record. But I will share a brief email exchange with one of the people who were sent out to investigate the kills because of his extensive experience researching and tracking down pumas in the USA. For the sake of his privacy, I'll call him Bob. Although this isn't Bob's voice, this is what he shared with me. I was never satisfied with the outcome there. 
Signs of post-mortem visitation by fox and raptors were present on the carcasses and that is totally usual, but in the end the actual killers were unclear to me. There were signs of domestic dog, tooth penetration was consistent with this, however the mess around the carcasses were too neat, unlike wild dogs that scrap and brawl over the kill. Still, the actual volume of flesh and muscle that was removed and the cleanliness of the subcutaneous layer was similar to big cat kills that I've seen in the USA. Yeah, that one was a bigger mystery than usual. Despite all the secrecy, it didn't stop me from getting in contact with the neighbours. I'm no expert, but I'm assuming a couple of fences isn't keeping this mysterious killer away from any temptations. That's when I found a man by the name of John who owned and ran a sheep farm on the opposite side of Jack Smith Lake and was only too happy to talk about what happened to him. John opened up by telling me of the moment alarm bells began to ring for him when he realised that perhaps our hungry friend from across the lake had started to pay him a visit. We're always either just going into a drought or just coming out of one, so you, you were losing a few stock anyway. You know? And I get barber pole worm here at times, you know, and, and a few sheep will die, and then, you know, like your foxes or your bloody wedge-tailed eagles or something will clean them up. You didn't really ever put it down as something was killing them, you know. The only time that I really woke up was when that fella come out, the field and game fella came out and said, you've got a sheep wandering around down there with his nose bitten off. And um, that, that was when I thought, well, hello, we're, we might have a, a visit from the fella across the lake, you know, the other side. There was another fella who used to live just across the road. And like a lot of times, he'd get some blokes to come in and shear some sheep and he'd say, yeah, you know, like there's 700 to shear or something. And then when they got them in, like there'd only be 550 or 600 or something, yeah. You know? And like good farmers don't lose that many without knowing something's going on, yeah. You know? Like I had a sheep got caught up in the fence down here in the lake, I don't know, about probably three weeks ago. And it had gone to jump through the fence and got its leg caught up and its ass had been eaten out. So, like, it was obviously a fox, you know. <laughs> like, the sheep the sheep was still alive, like, I had to put it down. You can smell a bloody fox, you know. Like, you go to, to a carcass where a fox has been and you can smell the urine, you know, and the shit, you know. Like, like it, 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 there was never any smell around when this thing had killed, you know. You know, I've seen a lot of things get killed in my lifetime, I said, but I've never seen anything that kills like this thing does. Like, we went to, we went to a lot of trouble, you know, like, we had bloody, we had goats tied up out in the paddock with sea sand all around them, you know, in case something come up to get a footprint. I was going down there every morning, driving around to make sure that nothing had been killed and like it. And I was locking the sheep in the in the yards of a night time. I'd go down there every morning and let them out. This, these these things were getting killed of a night, or first thing in the morning or of a night, you know. But there was a fair few of us that were reporting things that weren't, you know, weren't normal, you know. And one day, well, look, I don't, you've been to zoos and you've, um, you've been to bloody you know, circuses and things like that. And when and when the lion tamers and that are doing their act with the bloody circus, you know, that real throaty growl that a lion or a tiger will get. Like, we were both in bed one night and just outside the bedroom window here, we heard, we heard the same sound as that. And we, like, we both heard it, but it just sounded like the real deep throaty growl of, of you know, of one of those... <laughs> You know, as I said, like a circus act sort of bloody thing, you know? And like at one stage there, like we were putting the sheep in the yards and we were going down and camping in the hut and there was another bloke camping in the hut. And we were camping down there like every second night and really like the idea of camping out there was to shoot the thing and get something on the ground so you can say, well, here it is. And I'd take, you know, like animals that had been killed. I took one into the vet at one stage, you know, to see what what he reckoned, you know, like it, like it was just completely stripped out, you know, and everything. And I took it into the vet, and and he, I showed it to the vet, you know, and I said, well, you know, what the friggin' hell do you think it is, you know? And he said, he said, oh, he said, I, I don't know what it is. He said, but whatever it is, it's big.
and there was a bloke that used to work for the fisheries and wildlife down here in Victoria at that stage, you know? And he, he walked out of the... I was at the CFNL office, actually, you know, or DCN and RE or whatever they were calling themselves at that stage, you know? And, and he walked out, and I had this thing on the back of me, like I'd knocked off work into the sawmill, and, and he was walking out, and I said, what do you reckon's done this? And he said, oh, shit. He said, I don't know. He said, but I wouldn't like to tangle with it. And I said to him then about, you know, like a, whatever it was that was killing, I said, it, it eats the guts. And he, he, as he was getting into his youth, he just said to me, big cats eat awful. And then he just drove away. But, like, yeah, didn't want to be drawn into it. Didn't want to be quoted as, you know, such and such said this, you know. There's a lot of them that just reckon we're off with the fairies and then... There's the odd occasion, the one that comes up and says to us, look, I've seen it or had a, you know, something like that, you know. John put me onto his neighbour Andy, who lost fully grown merino sheep under very unusual circumstances. Just before speaking with Andy, I'd spoken to some sceptical locals who were pointing the finger of all this stock loss at wedge-tailed eagles. So I briefly ran the idea of this by Andy to see what his thoughts were. No. <laughs> uh, they operate during the night, do they? <laughs> if a wedge tail eagle attacks it, it just tears it to bits. Now, this, 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 these carcasses that were taken on our place, you could have put them back together. They were cleaned out and uh, bones were lit. You know, everything was just perfectly clean. Just bullshit about eagles. Um, because you'd clean, like the skin, the sheep, it'd, it'd have a hole in it at some, some, some place, and then they'd just eat right in through it, clean the neck out, and go right up to the skull and clean it all out. And then, as I say, you could have stitched it back together and it would have been a whole sheep again. They just, they never tore it to pieces. Yeah. We're a bit more north of Jacksonville's Lake, but, but yeah, yeah. We sort of helped, you know, look, look for them and, uh, tried to trap them and, and did all sorts of things, but they'll see you a heap of times and you, you'll you never see them. Uh, I never kept count, but they were just they were just operating, you know, there for two or three years where you had the problem. And you might, you'd go for a while and nothing would happen, then you'd go and you'd get some. But we've got some good photos, we've scanned sheep, and you can see the uh, where the, uh, the, you know, the claws have gone through the skin. Like, no other no other animal can do that. S- several uh, people have sided them, you know, have said they've sided, and, you know, but they don't want to talk about it. But they think they're, they think they're stupid. No, nobody really believes in it, but uh, unless, you, unless you've had stock killed or something, taking things, well, they don't believe it. I've had experience with being killed by foxes or dogs or or whatever, but nothing like like what was happening with these. What animal can clean a sheep out overnight? A wild domestic cat can't clean up a whole sheep. There was two good fang puncture marks in some of the skulls, as though something had put their mouth over the skull and, and gone through the skull. Peter had seen something large and cat-like years earlier, not far north from all the drama in Jack Smith Lake. This is Peter's story. Well, we reckon, yeah, we reckon still to this day, the wife and I at the time, still reckon it was one of those Gippsland panthers that they talk about. Well, we, I reckon from my memory, it was probably the winter of 87. Yeah, we'd been out in town for something. Um, <clears throat> and we're coming home down around the big bend at, at the Stockdale turn off down to Blackhall Creek and he was just there on, just in front of the bridge. His nose was on the white line and his tail was on the white line on the other side of the road, uh, heading north up Blackhall Creek itself. Oh, he was a, he was huge. You know, the the two, cause our, our headlights caught his eyes and they were just big orange. And we just looked at each other and we felt silent. And then we probably got within maybe 30 meters and he shifted off into the bush and but he was as jet black 
and and we could only tell the the size of him because I reckon his his sort of head was blackened out the white line in the middle, and his tail was stretched across the white line on the the other side, the unbroken one. So I reckon it was probably about you know two two and a half meters long from head to tail. I'd hate to have hit him, I tell you, because I was only a little Suzuki uh, Sierra in those days, and I wouldn't have um, if he'd have. <laughs> If he'd have been a bit slow off the mark, I'd have, I probably wouldn't, I'd be still in the creek, I think. Yeah, we spoke about it and we'd heard about the old Gippsland Panther when we first moved up here because we'd come from Melbourne. And, and it wasn't until we actually saw one um, that we actually believed the story. So I believe when we saw it, it was, we had heard about it. It was common knowledge that there are Panthers about, they're just hard to find. And we agreed that we'd seen our first and probably only Gippsland Panther. So. Alan had some overseas guests visiting his property, and as he was showing them the beautiful scenery from his porch, something casually strolled into their view. I've got no need to say anything. I'm not a bullshit artist. I had actually, uh, my wife was here on the day, and there was two rallies who were sadly deceased now. They were here on the day, and we live on a 20 acre block and it's we're still at the same place but uh we've been here about 30 years now and over the last 20 years it's it's got a bit more trade but you used to, be able to look straight down the block and these this this couple that were here with us that day they were my rallies that they were saying oh it's nice a couple of poms you know nice out here isn't it you get any wildlife and we said yeah the kangaroos come through and i said uh and as we looked down the paddock because it was about 200 meters away i said I said, oh, look, there's a bloody mangy one bat or something walking across the paddock. And because because we were keen and interested, we always used to have a set of binoculars inside the door there. So I grabbed the binoculars, put the binoculars on it, and it was a bloody, I swear, as true as I'm sitting here, um, it was a, a black-style cat with a loop, big loopy tail, I estimate to be about, you know, four foot long. And there was a big tree which has sadly fell over now down there, but it walked behind the tree and it just slowly walked as they do and it just walked near the dam and walked down the gully and that's it, gone. Yeah, well it walked directly behind this big tree and, and, and I was sort of amazed, you know, and I said to the wife, I said, bloody hell, so it's, it's a bloody big black, you never think at the time, you know, I said, it's a bloody big black, black cat. I said, you know, but the black cat, it walked behind the tree and then and then that was that. Was that. My son went playing cricket and and this fellow was out there, uh, he's about the same age as me, and we got talking, oh, where do you live? And I said, oh, I have Bride along. And he's a bit of a real Aussie bloke. And he goes, oh, yeah, he's a builder. He said, oh, I was working out there bloody years ago near your place. And we got talking, and he he said to me, he said, bloody hell, I believe you, mate. He said, I was driving around there one day, going to the job round the back, and this thing come down and jumped off the embankment in front of me and ran across the road him. He said, I don't give a shit if anyone believes me or not, he said so. And that's only from here, from where I saw it, I reckon the way the crow flies, it would probably be a kilometre and a half, two kilometres to where he saw it. It would have been around the same time. I was lucky enough for a local newspaper, the Gippsland Times, to run a story about my podcast around the exact same time my research had led me into the area. More farmers whose stock fell victim to an unknown killer came forward to tell me of their frustrations back in the day. Stanley was one of those farmers who owned and operated a large sheep farm in the Wellington Shire. I was getting getting one to two kills a day, every day. First thing in the morning would be just a, you know, a fresh attack and you'd have to bloody shoot them. Well, we were just getting regular kills all the time and you know, we were getting two, you know, at least you know, one to two every night, like you'd go out in the middle of the night, you know, sometimes you'd find them, other times you wouldn't see anything, other times you'd see big, huge, bright eyes. Um, they were not like eyes I've ever seen before, big, bright eyes. Um, one morning I went into this fun paddock and it was a stormy morning, overcast, windy, the wind must have been in my favour. I saw this dark thing run over the top of this slight sand hill, like covered in grass, but ran over. This is where the hobbits were. I drove up to the top of the sand hill and watched this big animal. And I've, I've bred Scottish deer hounds. I've had big breed dogs all my life, and it was not a dog. It stood out so, you know, it was solid. It had big legs, you know, not like a deer hound's legs, a running hound's legs or anything like that. I've hunted all over Australia. I've hunted pigs, wild dogs, you name it, type thing. You know, I've trapped wild dogs. 
Um, yeah, and these killings, I could go out in the old work ute and I could drive around the paddock and you would find just the skin and the skeleton the next morning. Fully cleaned up, no guts, no plucked wool, clean kill, just like if it was, yeah, but like it was boned out, but there was no intestines, anything it was just totally cleaned out. Occasionally we'd find ones with their faces bitten clean off, just below the eyes. Like some of the skins were that good. I could lean out of the ute and just bend down, like still sitting in the ute, and grab the carcass and, and flick it into the back of the old Hilux because there was nothing of it. All it was was, you know, lamb's bones, hogger bones, wieners kind of thing. Um, and, and you could flick it into the back of the ute. That's all what was left of it. There's no wool plucked out, nothing clean as clean kills. So mm. you'd swear that someone had scun them and, de and, and then boned the meat off the bones. So you can imagine someone skin in the street, you lay that out so the, the um, bull's laying on the ground, so you've got the skin there, and the bones the bones would be laying on the skin semi-attached to it still, with no guts, no intestines there, no wool plucked out, and all the bones lit clean. And there's nothing in Australia that will do that. Mate, I have seen a lot of things in my life, hunted since I was a kid, and I said, oh, I've never seen kill, you know, sheep killed like this in my whole life. We went spotlight in one night and we went out, uh, well, we'd go out. Every hour and a half, we'd go out and, uh, and check the hoggers. Now, we'd come in three different directions. So there was a couple in the ute with spotlight and rifles, and then another ute would come in at a different gate, and another ute would come in at a different gate, and never saw a thing. One of them reckons they saw bright eyes, but only a quick glimpse and it was gone. Well, we did that all night. I'd go in for an hour and a half and go back out. Well, in in between one of the hour and a half breaks, we went back out and he'd killed and eaten half a buddy hogget. I sat out there with forestry blokes with infrared goggles all night, 20, like a 12-hour stint, camping out in the paddock watching. Saw foxes poking around, but that was it. Now, I used to take, D, I used to take DNA swabs off the kills and they'd come back as negative then we i used to go you know if they were in the you know like the, you know if the kill was near the boundary fence where the where the, there was barbed wire i'd take hair samples just in case it was something you know um and scats as well so that's all right we keep getting back oh the hairs east of gray kangaroo and dna swabs are negative scats are negative um but the scats looked nothing like anything i've seen before so a mate went to Wonderworld or something up near Brisbane and they had two pet pumas walking around. So anyway, this bloke took swabs up there because he knew they were there and swabbed them, put swabs in their mouth and swabbed, well, one puma, a little young female, and they gave him a pinch of hair. So when, when, because I used to have to report where they were killed, what area in the Tusks or Clear Country or whatever, whatever. So, so every kill was kind of recorded. And anyway, <laughs> we got this kill this morning and then just went, there's the DNA swabs, there's the hair sample I found on the fence and here's a scat that I found, which come from Brisbane. Sent it in to be analysed and all of it come up negative, which we knew it wasn't Eastern Grey Kangaroo, but the hair came back as Eastern Grey Kangaroo and it wasn't, it was straight off this puma. So it makes you wonder, doesn't it? Throughout this investigation, I've been chatting with a naturalist by the name of Simon Townsend. Simon has spent decades following the story of big cats across southeastern Australia and has been a great help and a very patient resource for me behind the scenes. Simon co-authored a book with Dr. David Waldron on big cat folklore called Snarls from the Tea Tree. Simon also runs a website along with fellow researcher John Turner called Big Cats Victoria. It's here where they share a lot of their hard work from over the years. Stock kills have been a big focus on Simon's research, so I knew he'd be the perfect guy to chat with right about now. Kills, for me, a real clincher is that if dogs kill something, they tend to be very messy when they kill it. They'll drop the guts out of the thing. They don't take them away, bury them, or, you know, they're just right next to it. Say it's a sheep, there's wool everywhere. 
As far as I'm concerned, the real key is that if something is killed and then carried off into cover, for privacy, if you like, that is not bloody dogs. Dogs might take a portion of something, especially if they've got pups somewhere, but that, and so will foxes, of course, but they don't carry off whole large carcasses. When a whole large carcass is removed and then you find it in bracken or whatever, you know, fern of some sort or scrub away from where it was killed. And you might, you might be following drag marks, blood, blood, blood sign. It's a pretty good indicator that it's not canine. That's the key. That is the key. They, they have different behaviours. In South Australia, some years back, John and I were going to inspect some water holes for tracks in an area where there'd been some stock killing going on. We walked out, you know, good light, you know, we're too old to get up at bloody three o'clock in the morning. We went down the, down the paddocks and uh, it's slightly up and down country, and large, large, large patches of native forest, scrub rather, uh, in that part of the world. Limestone country, so there's hollows and, and all sorts of things and irregular ground. We go down, we followed a sheep walk along to the, where we knew the water holes were. Uh, we checked out the water holes. Then when we came back, there was a dead sheep still bleeding from its from throat wounds right beside the sheep walk that we walked down on and maybe two hours, three hours before. In the afternoon, I decided I'd go back with John to take photographs. And we went back and it was gone. Because it was reasonably fresh, we were able to follow the drag marks up into uh, a patch of uh, quite high tussock and, and bracken um, in, in the scrub. That made the hair in the back of my neck stand up, I can tell you. We were hot on its trail. We In the morning, we disturbed it. That's why it left the carcass. We disturbed it and it got out of the way. Then it came back, that's how cocky it is, came back to collect the carcass then take it to where it, it felt safe with it. And I'll tell you what, you know, uh, it was a weather and a good sized one. Now that, that makes you think, you know, that's something that did have trouble lifting. And, um, you know, it was dragged, um, clearly dragged and left, left quite, there was quite a trail. Now with uh, big cats, when they carting an animal that weighs almost as much as them or probably more sometimes, they walk with their front legs on either side of it and they drag it generally, not always, but generally by the throat to get to get into cover. Now, once again, there were no marks on the ground. You could not, other than the, the drag marks, there was nothing there because our conditions in Australia are bloody hopeless for tracks and that didn't eventuate. We couldn't find any tracks. I had an interview coming up about some livestock found high up in a tree. So I thought I'd ask Simon, while I had him here, if he's actually heard of anything like that. I personally have not come across an animal stashed in a tree, but I have seen film made here in northeastern Victoria, New South Wales border, of that very behaviour. And I've also seen from that particular, uh, it was a kangaroo, not a big one, but a kangaroo all the same. Uh, up, a, up a tree, uh, I think it was a pine tree, uh, um, but the cat was with it. And when it was disturbed, it came down. This was filmed. Now that film, I have not had any chance in relocating it. I got to see it privately uh, at, a, at a bloke's house through sheer luck. This is, you know, my, I've told you about my colleague, John Turner. We got to watch it. And as, I'm not joking, that was one seriously angry um, a black leopard in in the film it was it, at night and under light a light you know a handheld spotlight but the the very fact that it was a kangaroo not anything else meant it was in australia that for me means nothing surprises this caching behavior in trees it tends to be when there's other predators that would compete or possibly even chase off given leopard and uh, in this particular case, it's all wild dog country. And it's the same with the other ones that have, been, that have been reported to me. I've done my homework and found out there were dogs, wild dogs present. Now wild dogs will gang up on something they don't like. They will steal its food, etc., etc. 
So it probably wouldn't take long for any young leopard to work out that, you know, it goes to a lot of trouble to kill a half grown roo and then um, suddenly, you know, it's there's half a dozen um, dingoes and dingo crosses standing around it, giving it a hard time. And it doesn't like that at all. It bolts up the tree anyway, but they're intelligent enough to learn the, what they can do to stay clear of the dogs because the dogs can't climb trees. Going down now to the Macedon Ranges, which sits roughly 55 kilometres north-northwest from the centre of Melbourne CBD, I spoke with Trish. Trish tells me a sad story of how they lost their family pet in the most unusual circumstances. Quite a long time ago, when one of our we we loaned our goats to some people up at um, on the main road at Mount Macedon at a place called Matlock, and. Um, and they were eating the blackberries and they rang us to say that it was that one, this particular one was dead and so we went up and they couldn't believe that it was actually up in a tree it had been killed and taken up into the branch of the tree and in that in those days i mean it was just something that we'd never ever seen before yeah, we had to walk. It's a beautiful old garden called Matlock. It's a property on the main road at Mount Macedon. Um, and it was, yeah, we couldn't see it straight away. We had to get out of the car and go to it because it was sort of, you know, it was eating blackberries, you know, just on the outskirts of the, you know, the part that they hadn't cleared. And then we couldn't quite believe our eyes. It was just, you know, a little goat wedged in, you know, the, in the, branches of the trees and it was still on it still on its chain poor little thing it was a big trunk and then there was you know the branch so it was an, an older tree it was a big tree in those days people sort of talked about it and thought they saw sightings but this was sort of the first thing where we thought oh my god it could possibly be I've never heard of anything like that. But my darling Bob passed away five years ago and he had all the stories. It's quite sweet, really. But um, when, when I brought him home from the hospital and, and we knew that he was dying and the, the, the ambulance driver who brought him back um, came into the house and, and he asked about the, the, the panthers. He said, oh, you've ever seen any panthers up here? And Bob, who could hardly talk, all came alive and started to tell him all these stories. Yeah, it was amazing. We live on a property that backs onto Mount Tarong. It's just like bush all behind us. And he, he did a lot of walking and, and um, being very stealthful up there. And he swears that he saw one and even the paw print. We were, we were devastated because we loved our goats. We had them for milk. But my son was allergic to normal milk, so we got goats to milk for him to have that. So, and they bred, and, uh, and that's why we had the goats. But it was fully grown, and it was dragged. I mean, it, we just couldn't. I remember standing there. It was a huge tree in a very old garden. And, um, and yes, and, and it was on a chain. So they dragged it up on the chain and that's as far as they could get it. So, and the poor little thing was, you know, it was very dead and it was just that he hadn't eaten it, which was really interesting. So we were devastated because it was, you know, it's bad enough that it died, that it, you know, it was just gobsmacked that it was up in the tree, yeah. When the kids were growing up, there used to be a wildlife park on our, on the way out from Bacchus Marsh on the hills on the right there and it was fantastic and you could drive through the animals the lions and the tigers you know they fell on bad times and I think the animals were badly looked after in the end because they didn't have the money somewhere up near Ballarat there was a panther in a huge big you know sort of mobile cage that someone had bought of course, we were fascinated by it. And Bob was chatting to the man, the, the man that was looking after it. And apparently, it came from that Bacchus Marsh place. They rescued it. For some reason, 
they had it in this cage and the man said that he heard them cry out to each other apparently in during the night they had a particular particular sound and he used to hear others sort of over, over the hills not sort of far. they used to call to each other but we were quite enchanted by that Trisha's daughter, Cara, still has childhood memories of the event, which have been stuck in her mind to this day. You know, we had a goat that was unexplainably dragged up a tree and dead. I remember, I remember pretty, pretty vividly of where it, where it happened and the detail. That it, was a, it was a big drama in our life at the time. They found it up, up quite a long way up a tree about 20 feet up a straight tree that it, that it couldn't climb up anyway and it was kind of wedged in a, in a branch. I think about it from time to time now is the whole mystery of it because it was never really resolved as to how, this, how the hell this goat got up in a tree and was killed um, with no sign to, to say obviously what had happened. And Dad was always, after that, Dad had a fascination with, with you know, trying to find a panther or trying to find something that could actually physically do that. Yeah, it was all, it was a bit of a shock to all of us because they, they were pet goats and, you, like, I still think about it today, so it's kind of always in the back of my mind. And it, always we're hearing stories, particularly around Mount Macedon, of someone had seen a, a panther, but no one could ever actually get proof. So it's just something that's always been a little bit a part of our lives, I guess. Uh, and because we had that close experience and an animal killed, that it was like, well, they, prob- they probably are out there. John was a family friend of Trish and Cara's and lived at the property where the goat was found. He remembers something specific about the tree that they'd found a little later on. We used to let um, get friends also bring their goats to our place to um, help, help clear the blackberries. We well, were probably about 10 years old at the time. But what I do remember is that it was killed. It was it was bad enough to keep kids away from seeing it. There were claw marks on the tree. And that's the part that I really remember. And they got the tape measure out and they tried to work out, well, if these are claw marks, how, um, and, the, and the animal was on its hind legs, how big was this thing? Um, it's, it's a really big cat. There, there was never sort of a thought then that hey, so it's absolutely a panther. Wildlife professionals have a duty, if they're paid out of the public purse, to listen to people who've been disturbed by something they've seen, not to be put down or made to feel foolish. These are, these are the taxpaying public who pay their bloody wages. There is an onus, there is an onus of care and of duty and of public responsibility. And it does not mean deriding people just because they they may be uh, consider themselves, I might add, they might consider themselves intellectuals or, God help us, experts. They still have a responsibility to the public, and that that is to not just to allay people's fears, but to listen to them because that's one of the first things that gets people one on side, and two feeling comfortable about themselves again when they've had an unusual experience that's really frightened them. I always thought it got out of Worth Circus. The circus had been up there under the bridge and it, it was after that had gone that the panther started being seen and I always thought it got out of that because there was a fella came down here from the circus. He thought he was a smart ass. He, he, he was having a look around. He was looking for something, but he wouldn't say what. He just, he just came down here and asked us, had we seen anything strange about? To all those who love the stories of big cat sightings, you should also head over to Big Cat Conversations in the UK, which is hosted by Rick Minter. 
Rick is not only a nice bloke, but quite knowledgeable on the topic of big cats and talks with some really credible witnesses. That's Big Cat Conversations. Get on it. If you're enjoying Missing Panther so far, please tell a friend about it and make sure you subscribe to keep updated on each episode. If you'd like to support the show to help us continue this investigation, go to our website, missingpanther.com.au. Hit the About button, scroll down and follow the prompts to forward your much appreciated donation. If you believe you've seen a panther or a large cat, or even if you believe you know how they got here, go to our website, missingpanther.com.au. Get us through the contact page. Missing Panther is edited and narrated by me, Ben Bede. Music is by Warwick Party. Mastering by Paul Gomesall. Voiceover by Maddie Glenn.